Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Morris Museum on this lovely Sunday morning. My name is Cleveland Johnson. I'm the new executive director here. Um, I, just, I just recently moved here from the National Music Museum in South Dakota, so I woke up this morning feeling very much at home in the nice wintry landscape around me. Although it's very warm here for a uh, December day, I would have to say. Um, I'm thrilled uh, to introduce, um, well, thrilled first of all to welcome you here. I'm so happy to see you all. You know, the Morris Museum um, takes very seriously its role here in the community, its role here in Morris County. And when we heard about this fantastic, um, exciting discovery right next door in Madison, we thought and started scratching our heads, what can we do to help the community feel a part of this? And, and understand more of uh, this remarkable uh, discovery that was made over in, in Madison. So, um, push came to shove, we decided to bring, um, uh, bring this event together and invite all of you here to learn more about um, what, uh, what, uh, what has been discovered in Madison. I want to introduce very quickly uh, a gentleman who will eventually introduce our morning speaker to you. Uh, Nicholas Platt is a former mayor of Harding Township and he's the president of the Hartley Dodge Foundation. And he's going to introduce our speaker this morning, Mallory Mortelaro. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You know, everyone loves a story. And what you're going to hear today is probably going to beat them all. And the reason I'm introducing Mallory is because I don't think that she would do justice to how this all came about. Um, the Hartley Dodge Foundation was established in 1935 by Geraldine Rockefeller Dodge, who built the Madison Borough Hall in memory of her son. The foundation has one mission, to ensure the architectural and historical integrity of the building. It is museum quality, to, in today's dollars, it would probably cost anywhere from 80 to 100 million dollars to replace. Um, there is probably no municipal building in the United States like it, and in fact, there are few state buildings that are like it. In 2007, the Earl of Madison renovated, and so little did the foundation know about his art collection that when it came to this particular subject today, it weighed over 700 pounds and the thought that it was going to cost us $10,000 to build ramps to get it out of the building while the renovation took place was too much for us to spend. So what we did is we asked the contractor to build a plywood box around it, move it to the center of the room, and there it sat for three years of renovation among bags of cement and scaffolding. <laughs> so that gives you an idea of how much we knew about uh, this, this subject today. A few years ago, um, the foundation said, you know, we have to get a better handle on our art collection um, that is in the council chamber. So Janet Foster, one of our trustees, put an ad in the Drew uh, newsletter. And a young lady showed up and said, gee, this looks like a great project. Now, one of the most interesting parts of this story is that even when Mallory had a hunch that there was something more to that 700 piece of art in the corner, the trustees didn't give it any credibility. And it wasn't until Mallory, after a year of hitting closed doors, people who were experts in the field, not willing to come out from Philadelphia or New York to even take a look at it, 
saying you don't have some, you don't have anything. Um, so we were all very skeptical. So when Mallory, young Mallory, walked up the marble stairs to the Hartley Dodge building with the foremost expert in Rodin, who traveled from Paris to take a look at it because he was, he was convinced by Mallory that there was something that he had to take a look at. It wasn't until he came into the room and I gathered the mayor of Madison, the Hartley Dodge Foundation board, and a, and a few people, interested people, that he walked in and looked over in the corner. It was about the distance from here to the corner over here and sort of did a double take and walked over to it and said, so my friend, this is where you've been hiding. <laughs> <laughs> so before I introduce Mauer, I want to give you a little uh, sense of how the news media works. Once we had gone through the authentication process, which took another uh, several months, even with the photograph that Mallory is going to show you with the artist leaning against the very bust that was sitting in the corner. It took another two months for him to say, yes, it's real. So we felt we owed it to the residents of Madison rather than just spring it on them, oh, by the way. Um, and then, oh, by the way, it is real and it's leaving tomorrow. Um, we had a security issue, and that is it was valued at between four and twelve million dollars. And we still the Earl of Madison still had to run their government out of this room, and we couldn't afford the uh, the security, and we didn't want to move it out of there without uh, and we still wanted to get insurance. So we decided we were going to have a, uh, a, a tour um, and open up the building to Madison residents and anybody else that was interested before it left for Philadelphia. So we had a date that was going to go to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and so we opened up the doors. Well, you know what an embargo story is. So the foundation didn't think there was much to the story, and we thought it would be a local, of local interest. So I called up the uh, editor-in-chief of the Madison Eagle, the local newspaper, and I said, listen, we got a really interesting story that the residents of Madison would be interested in hearing. And she said, oh my God, that is just a wonderful story. And, uh, and I said, well, I'll embargo it, meaning you, you publish on Thursday, and I will not reach out to any other news media until Wednesday afternoon. And she said, perfect, it'll go on the front page of the Madison Eagle. Um, well, Wednesday afternoon came around, I was doing some things, I said, well, listen, I just think that this might, people in Marstown might have an interest. And so I called up the Marstown Daily Record, uh, Bill Westhoven, a reporter right now, and I said, Bill, this is about four o'clock on Wednesday. I said, Bill, I, I have a story that you'll, I think you'll really find fun. And he said, boy, that's a great story. So he writes it up, and around 6 o'clock, he said, he calls and said, Nick, I'm going to post it online right now. And um, so around 7 o'clock, he calls up and said, Nick, something really curious is happening. And the editor of the Bergen Record, which is a parent to, one of the parents to the Marstown Daily Record, which has 10 times the circulation, um, loves this story and wants to run it. I said, Bill, that's great. He says, but there's more. So we were having coffee, and the editor-in-chief of the Gannett newspaper, which owns USA Today, walked in and said, oh my God, this is one of the best stories I've heard. 
So when we went to the Madison Borough Hall the next morning, NBC, CBS, <laughs> ABC, NPR, among some of the other sound trucks were out front. And the NBC reporter um, got a late start because she hadn't seen it until about 7 o'clock that morning. And she called on the phone. This is Jen Maxwell, who you see on, on the news. And she goes, am I going to Philadelphia or am I going to Madison? Because this is one of the best stories I have heard in over a decade. Um, so within three days, it was in 500 newspapers. It was translated in, at last count, nine different languages, including the Iranian Daily News. <laughs> um, a friend of mine and I were in um, Abilene, Kansas, and it was on the top banner of the uh, Kansas Gazette. Um, Lost Rodin found in a Madison town, in a New Jersey town. So, this is all due to a remarkable young lady that I would like to come up, uh, Mallory Mortavara. Mallory. Literally, <laughs> there. 
One of Geraldine's collection, uh, uh, sorry, not collections, um, interests was dogs and dog shows. She was one of the founders of the Morris and Essex Kennel Club. So that's really one of the things I see people nodding. That's what we know Geraldine for. And she, when she was a founder of the Morris and Essex Kennel Club, she also helped establish the Morris and Essex Kennel Club dog show, which ran for decades. And this was one of the biggest events, um, one of the most well-attended single-day events. Um, so they would have 55,000 people there, 10,000 cars parked there, and they had this at Hartley Farms, her husband's estate, um, on the polo fields there. Geraldine's the one in the middle. This photo is from 1927. This is a picture of the dog show, so you can really see, like I said, the amount of people and, and commotion and things going on. Um, so this is a very much a big part of, of her legacy, and as I said, dogs were um, everything of her. She really was very passionate about dog showing. Um, she, another claim to fame that she has is she was the first uh, female judge of Westminster, so she was very well respected um, in the world of the dog show. <laughs> Here we have a picture of uh, Geraldine and her husband, Marcellus Hartley Dodge, at one of the dog shows. Geraldine and Marcellus did have one son. Here we have a picture of the father and son together. So their son, Marcellus Hartley Dodge, same name as his father, though he most often went by his middle name, Hartley. He, in 1930, had just graduated from Princeton. And when you talk about having the world at your feet, being the only son of one of you know, the nation's wealthiest couples, just having graduated from Princeton, it really seemed like he could do anything. He had recently taken up the hobby of flying, and his mother said that it made her nervous, could he please not fly so much? So that summer, right after he graduated, some of his friends were going to Europe, like many young aristocrats would, and she encouraged him to go on the trip because she said, I don't want you here, you're just going to fly around and that's going to make me nervous. So she encouraged him to go to Paris, and that summer on July 29th, he turned 22 years old, and that August, in France, he was killed in an automobile accident. So one can only imagine how incredibly devastated his parents were, especially with this being their only child. Um, so Geraldine who was always a philanthropist, threw herself into her philanthropy even more. She wanted there to be something forever to remember Hartley. So one of the things that she did was she spent a lot of money and a lot of resources to build Madison a borough hall that would be named after her son. So it became the Hartley Dodge Memorial. And now when you say borough hall, when you say town hall, people imagine like these you know, old buildings with drop ceilings and it's kind of like the old carpeting and it's a little dingy. But this is what Madison calls their town hall. Um, it is beyond grand, over 65,000 square feet. The building is built of the finest marble and granite. Bronze doors are everywhere, including the doors to the basement. Okay, so it's, it's beautiful and, and beyond anything that you would expect for a, a small town like Madison. Um, so, Geraldine's cousins at the same time were building Rockefeller Center. Now, I always find it fascinating because everybody in the world has Rockefeller Center, and people live within 10 miles of this building and don't even know that it exists. But they actually shared a lot of the same suppliers. You know, she would say to her cousins, I know a good person from Marvel, and they, they would share the same, um, you know, people. So, it's, it's built in a similar style in that same sense of, of grandeur. So, if you have never been, you definitely need to um, take a look at the Hartley Dodge Memorial. Now, Geraldine, though, realized that, um, that what she was building was beyond grand. So she made some um, plans to make sure the building was maintained. So here we have her in a picture actually handing the deed over to the, the mayor. So she actually gifted the building to the town. It wasn't just that she was letting them use it. She, she handed them the deed and said, this is yours. But she also put in other measures to make sure the building um, was maintained. So she realized, look, I'm making this place with marble floors and there's 19th century silver plated chandeliers hanging up. I know that people aren't going to, you know, townspeople aren't going to pay taxes to pay to have this marble polished. And I know that in a few decades this building won't be as beautiful and grand as it is now. And she, of course, did not want that to happen. So she created the Hartley Dodge Foundation, which, as Nick explained at the beginning of, of our talk, that it is a group whose mission is to maintain the integrity of the building. And they do a fantastic job. If you have ever been in this building, it looks like it's brand new. And it is, you know, they pay for those mar the marble floors to be polished. They pay to have the chandeliers restored. Things that a regular town would not do. Now, Geraldine also decorated the town hall with some artwork. Now, Geraldine herself 
had an incredible art collection, and when she passed away, it was auctioned off by Sotheby's. And at that time, it was considered to be one of the largest auctions Sotheby's had ever handled, just to give you a sense of, of the sheer volume of, of things that she had in her collection. So when she would come over to the Harley Dodge Memorial, there's stories that she would come up and hang up a painting and, and then go home. And you know, maybe a few days later she'd bring in a sculpture, put it in the corner, and, and then go home. She didn't say, here's what I'm leaving, here's all the paperwork that goes with it, here's where I got it from. She just kind of hung things up the way she likes them and left. So one would imagine at the time that she probably said, you know, this is a portrait of so-and-so, I got it here, isn't that great? And, and I, I would imagine that maybe she would share that with some people in the building. But over decades and decades, that information was lost to us and nothing was written down, like I said, no paperwork. So we, we didn't have um, any records of what was in this building. Which leads us to this guy. So, as I said, my involvement at the Hartley Dodge Foundation began in 2014. I answered an ad for a part-time, temporary, one-year project to be an art cataloger, which I didn't 100% know what they meant by that, but it sounded kind of fun. And when I met with them, they explained that they had a large collection of historic photographs that they had just put together. And uh, they did kind of like a crowdsourcing project, which was really neat, asked people to share old photographs of Madison and some of the surrounding areas. They got them professionally enlarged and framed, and they used those to adorn the walls of the Hartley Dodge Memorial. And it's, it's an incredible collection. Um, but they had over 200 of them, and they didn't have any record of what they had or how to keep track of it. So that was largely why they had hired me to create a cataloging system for those photos. And they also said, look, we do have some artwork as well in our council chambers. So if you're interested in taking a look and, and researching anything, you know, we would like it included in the catalog, and if you can find out anything, that would be great. So I asked the question, well, what information do you guys have so far? Is there some paperwork you can hand me or, or something? And they said, we have nothing. And I said, okay, sounds fun, you know, we'll see what I do. Um, so again, it was a one-year project, a part-time kind of job. Um, and uh, when I'm in there, you know, looking around, I, I figured, let me see if I can find any signatures or any um, dates on, on something that might help me out. So I started poking around, and you know, people say, like, how did no one notice a signature? How did no one notice these things? Until I was brought in, frankly, no one was really ever asked to be as nosy as I was, right? You know, I, I was asked to go and look at these pieces and, and nose around a little bit. Um, and at that time, I did find this, a Rodin. So everyone says to me, oh my gosh, you must have been jumping up and down. You saw the signature of Rodin, one of the greatest artists of all time. And I don't know if it makes me sound like a total skeptic, but I wasn't. I was more thinking, this is really odd. Why did you say Rodin on it? Surely this isn't, you know, they wouldn't just have an actual Rodin marble sculpture sitting here. You know, that, that just seems too weird. Um, but I was definitely intrigued, and I definitely thought, i got to look into this. But at the same time, I was just hired to do the cataloging, and time was kind of running out. I had to finish what I was hired to do. So I made a note on my spreadsheet, Rodin, question mark, get back to later. <laughs> I didn't have to do what I had to do. Um, so finally, when we get to our last uh, meeting, it, it's the end of our, our one-year contract, and I'm supposed to hand the trustees their catalog, and they're supposed to hand me a check, and we're supposed to say goodbye. I did mention to them, you know, I think you might have a rodent. And they just kind of said, well, why? Why do you think that? And well, there's a signature. And so we all took a field trip down the halls of the council chambers and showed them the signature. One by one, they all you know, took a look and went, huh, okay. Um, and then they asked me to leave the room. And so I did. And when I came back, they said, we'd like to hire you indefinitely and you can keep working with us. <laughs> so, and again, just like as I said earlier, I really have to say thank you to the Hartley Dodge Foundation because like I always say, I was 22 years old and had an undergraduate degree in art history, told them that I thought they had a Rodin, and they said, okay, you go, you go do it. So I really am so thankful that they had so much trust in me um, and really gave me the confidence and the support um, that I needed throughout this process. So this is the council chambers where Napoleon was sitting in the corner. Um, and. You know, so now they've hired me indefinitely. Um, of course, this is like a side job, so you know I'm doing this evenings and weekends and, and when I can. Um, and I'm like, okay, so I think we have a Rodin. What do you do, right? And you're probably sitting there going, what do you do? And that's exactly what I was saying to myself as well. 
So Rodanum is a very well documented artist, of course. So first I just was looking at any books or, or catalogs I could find, thinking maybe this piece would show up in there. And I wasn't really having any luck. Um, but then a lot of things that I was, I was reading were saying that, you know, when you think you have a, a new piece of art, it's about getting it authenticated by an expert who would be able to tell um, if it was created by that artist. So I started reaching out to a lot of different institutions that had Rodin collections. Um, I started reaching out broader and broader as I wasn't getting answers to anyone tangentially related to Rodin. Um, either I wouldn't hear back from people or I would hear back with kind of these cryptic messages that basically said, you know, everyone thinks they have a Rodin and, you know, <laughs> good luck. Um, and then finally, I did hear back from the Frick. And while they also told me they couldn't help me, they didn't authenticate, they did tell me that they um, knew who could. So this was months and months of, of sending emails and making phone calls. So finally now I had something, you know, someone that I, I could um, contact. And they told me about the Committee Rodin. And they said the Committee Rodin is an organization in Paris, and they essentially have like a huge database of all of Rodin's works, where they are, who bought them, when they were created. And they said they have a man there, Jerome Leblay. They said he's the guy that if you're going to get someone out to look at this piece and tell you if it's, it's, if it's the real deal or not, it's him. So I'm excited now because again, months of, of getting nowhere, um, you know, I feel like I have something. So I write to the committee Rodin, and they get back to me, but it's an automated response, and it comes with an application you're supposed to fill out when you think you have a Rodin. So I thought I was like so unique and special, like I think I have a Rodin, you know, I'm <laughs> um, and they actually have like a standardized form that you fill out for people who think they have Rodin. So I filled it out, but now I'm feeling a little disheartened because they even say when you send it back, you know, thanks for sending it in. Look, we're really busy. So if we think that this, you know, warrants a response, we'll get back to you. But if not, best of luck. So at this point, I'm getting frustrated because it's been, like I said, several months of really getting nowhere. And we've got this big hunk of marble that says Rodin on it. Like I'm thinking it's got to be something, right? Um, so I send in my application, but I also send a few pictures directly to Jerome LeBlay himself. They told me he was the one to get in touch with. So I send him the pictures and a brief message. Within six hours, I got a response, not from his assistant, but from him himself. And he said, you have a great discovery. This is Napoleon enveloped Don Sun Rev, a marble bust we have lost track of since the 1930s. I will be in New York in a few weeks and I must come see it. So when people say, when were you jumping up and down? That was the moment I was jumping up and down. <laughs> Um, funnily enough, he also mentioned that the last person he knew who owned it in the 1930s was Thomas Fortune Ryan. So at this point, I'm really excited to actually have some real news to share with the trustees rather than having her back, having her back, having her back. So I excitedly emailed them all this information that I just got, and they are sharing the story with some friends, and it turns out that one of our trustees, uh, Nick Platt, who we heard from earlier, knows the great-grandchild of Thomas Fortune Ryan. And they, she's kind enough to actually go through um, her family archive, and she finds the auction catalog from when her grandfather's art collection was auctioned off, and she actually is able to find the page with Napoleon and Bella Don't on it. So that was huge for us, um, and also one of those kind of small world <laughs> instances. But um, it was so exciting to actually see the piece in black and white, a picture of it, a description of it, um, anywhere, you know, I hadn't seen it anywhere besides just in the corner in the council chambers here. So it started to make it feel a little more real and a little more concrete. And through that um, auction catalog entry, we also found that the piece had been displayed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art from 1915 to 1929. So I was able to, um, from the Met Archives, get any, any kind of things that they had about the piece, which was also, um, really interesting and helped add to our background on the piece. So a few weeks after that, as promised, Jerome LeBlanc does come out to Madison to see the piece. So we, um, as Nick said, you know, he, he comes up the stairs and he looks in the corner and, and says that, so my friend, this is where you've been hiding. Um, and he spends quite a bit of time with us talking about the piece and it was really interesting to hear someone who devotes their whole life to one artist um, really appreciate this piece in a, in a new level and just all the things that go into authenticating a sculpture that you don't even think of. Something that he was really interested in was the type of marble, not just that it's white Carrera marble, but he can tell where um, 
from pieces that fit into the timeline what pieces he was using. So like the pieces that were, would have been very similar for, would have been from the same time period. So just by examining the marble, he can tell what kind of year this would make sense and uh, based off of what Rodin was using at the time. So all these little things that the average person looking at would never think about. It, um, it's really been great to work with him and he's been incredibly helpful um, to us. So he comes out, he looks at the piece, says, you know, I think, um, he thinks, of course, right away that, you know, this is the real deal, but it's not just as easy as that. You know, it's not just seeing a signature and saying, oh, well, it must be a Rodin. So I'm really proud to say that for a piece that started with absolutely no background and, and paperwork known, um, we now have a complete provenance or history of ownership and, and craft um, from Rodin's studio to the corner of the council chambers at the Hartley Dodge Memorial. So what we learned is that the piece was originally commissioned in 1904. Now, for reasons unknown, the commission went unfinished. It could be a variety of things. The person could have uh, not had the money to pay. They could have passed away. Um, it's possible sometimes, too, marbles took a really long time. So sometimes um, the person who commissioned it would kind of lose interest and then be a little annoyed that it was taking so long. Um, so for whatever reason, it, it was started but, but incomplete. Now, in 1908, Thomas Fortune Ryan, he's the American collector who, who once owned the piece, he is traveling to Paris because he wants to meet Rodin and see Rodin's studio and also commission a few pieces while he's there. So in 1908, he is visiting Rodin's studio and he sees the half-finished bust of Napoleon. And he says, you know, I like that. Would you also complete that and, and send him over when, when you send over the other pieces I'm commissioning? And he does. And in 1910, uh, the piece is completed and shipped over to New York along with uh, Thomas Fortune Ryan's other pieces. Now, Thomas Fortune Ryan is a really important person in collecting uh, Rodin in the United States. He collected so many Rodins and donated so many, along with money to buy more, to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, that they were actually the first museum in the United States to have a solo gallery dedicated to the work of Rodin. And for whatever reason, though, he donated some of the other pieces from this 1910 quarter, but he didn't uh, donate Napoleon right away, or, or ever, actually. He kept him in his home in Manhattan. Now, in 1915, though, he did decide that he wanted to loan it to the Met. So it was on display at the Met from 1915 until 1929. At the very end of 1928, Thomas Fortune Ryan passed away. So in 1929, his um, estate was auctioned off. So the piece was pulled from the museum since he didn't gift it to them. He only put it on a loan there. So it was pulled out and it was sold at auction. Um, by an auction that was handled by the Park Burnett Auction House in New York City. And it was purchased by Holly McClure. Now for a long time, Holly McClure was kind of this roadblock because I knew 1935, you know, the Hartley Dodge Memorial was dedicated in 1935, but we know that the artwork was put in shortly after that. So I know that Geraldine should be coming into the picture pretty soon. And the piece was sold to Holly McClure. Now, it wouldn't have been uncommon for someone like Geraldine to have a buyer, right? She wouldn't necessarily be going to the auctions herself. But I still wasn't finding anything about Holly McClure until I was able to uncover that Holly McClure was actually a dog handler. <laughs> now, remember, Geraldine is big into dogs and dog shows. So it was actually one of her dog handlers. And she had asked him that day to go to this auction. And these are the pieces I'd like. So the piece was purchased for $7,000. Now, everyone moans and groans at that, but you could buy a house for $7,000 in 1935, so it was still a lot of money. Um, so from there, the piece was put in the corner of the council chambers and uh, stayed there for a number of years. And like I said, it, um, I'm sure at, at some point, I'm sure she said, you know, this is a Rodan that I purchased, but because there was never any paperwork, there was never any real anything um, to confirm that, no one knew. And also, it's important to note that, you know, it's just seeing a signature on the piece can only get you so far. A museum wouldn't have taken it if we just said, look, it says Rodin on it, right? <laughs> so it's really uh, about the authentication process and also about having a, a provenance of that, that history of the piece. This is one of the best things that we got from Jerome LeBlay um, when he was doing his research um, in the Musée Rodin archives. He said, I got something pretty good for you. And he sent this over. Um, this, so the, the picture was, we think, taken probably around 1910, right before the piece was sent out. 
Um, and at that point, um, Rodan was very, very much established in his career. And I think, I love the picture because I think it really, like, he's kind of owning it. Like, he knows that he's going to go down in history as, as one of the most important sculptors. Um, so it, it's a great, uh, a great piece. Okay. Um, so once we knew all of this, we couldn't just get up and tell everybody. <laughs> we really wanted to. Um, but as Nick said, you know, the Hartley Dodge Memorial is a working town hall. And we didn't have security in place or the staff in place to safely display and exhibit a multi-million dollar piece of art. So we had to sit on the secret for about two years. Wow. <laughs> now people say, oh my gosh, isn't it so hard? And of course we told like close friends and family, talked about it around the dinner table, that kind of thing. Um, but Honestly, it wasn't that hard when you know that you're doing the right thing and, and basically protecting the peace. You know, we didn't want people to know and be coming there and, and you know, doing God knows what. So we, um, you know, it, it wasn't that bad when you know that you're doing the right thing for the peace. And we, of course, in that meantime, were planning that one day we would tell people. And so I always wanted to get the peace in the museum. I thought for a lot of reasons that would be um, a good fit for it. You know, he's kind of been, been anonymous for decades. I thought he deserved to be kind of back on the stage. Um, and, you know, as we said, we are not a museum, and so we could not give it the, the care that it needed. So we, um, with the help of Jerome LeBlay, contacted a few museums that we thought would be good fits. Now, a lot of things in the art world, it's all about like long-term planning. You talk to a museum now, they're probably planning their like 2023 20, exhibition. So a lot of things we were talking about were, you know, looking way in the future. Uh, just this past August, though, we had a curator from the Philadelphia Museum of Art out to look at the piece. And she said, you know, this piece is great. She was really excited about it. She loved the story. And she mentioned, you know, it's a centennial year for Rodin, meaning this is the centennial of his death this year. She goes, it's a really big year for Rodin. Maybe we could take him in the fall. And it was one of those things where I kind of thought I must hurt her because this was August and like the fall was really a few weeks away. So I kind of said, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. And she left and I followed up, you know, to say thank you and then sent an email um, and emailed back and forth a little bit. And then September 27th, she sends me an email saying, you know, we'd actually love to take the piece. We'd like to come October 27th to pick it up. Now, you guys are probably saying, well, what's the big deal? You just see they're going to haul them away. You guys don't have to do anything. But as Nick said, we had agreed that we wanted him to kind of have a moment in Madison before we shipped him away. We didn't want to tell everybody, hey, guess what we had? Rodan, but he's gone now. So we wanted to make sure that people got a chance to hear the story and to see something that's really a part of their town's history. So that meant we had four weeks <laughs> to coordinate our press coordinate any kind of exhibition we wanted to have, a uh, reception, and also negotiate a loan with a major museum. So it was a busy four weeks, but I'm really proud to say that we pulled it off. Um, so we, we um, had one weekend where we were open um, for the public to come. We had this great banner outside letting people know um, about our, our Rodan. And we had a gallery reception with over 300 people in attendance. And we had, um, like I said, we had a weekend with, our, our estimate is about 1,500 people came out to see him and to learn about him. And what I've been happiest with is that I really feel like people want to learn about the artwork. I've had so many good questions, not just from my sixth graders in class, but from, you know, all, all sorts of people asking, um, you know, and really wanting to know about the history of the piece. So it's really been nice to see a genuine interest um, in this. I was not expecting to get this many people, though. Um, to be honest, the first day that we were open, I brought a book with me because I was like, you know, they're making some downtime. I was like, I might not be sitting there, so I'll bring a book, but I can do that. Um, so just a few weeks ago, we were, um, our, our foundation was invited out to Philadelphia um, for kind of the unveiling of Napoleon. So we were invited on a really special day. It was November 17th. 2017, which was the centennial of Rodin's death. So um, it was a, a big day for the museum. This is the Moudon Gate outside of the Philadelphia, um, sorry, the Rodin Museum. Um, and it's a replica of uh, Rodin's grave. So it was a really special celebration to be there and to be included um, with Rodin experts from all parts of the world and um, to be, you know, not only to be paying attention to their exhibition, but also to, um, they did a great job of highlighting our piece and, and our story as well. So 
That day, I honestly didn't even get to really take a picture with Napoleon because, as you can see, he's kind of a star now, so he's always kind of surrounded by, you know, camera crews and everything. Um, but really, when we were there, it was um, really great to see that people were, like I said, even it's not just the Madison that people are excited about the story, but um, throughout the whole art world, people are, are really abuzz about it. Um, and here he is in Philadelphia. Um, so, you know, we wanted the piece to be in a museum not just because it's fun to say, yeah, we want to use in a museum, but again, because I think that having a collection like the Harley Dodge Foundation has isn't only about you know maintaining it and ensuring it and making sure our lighting is okay, but it's also about giving some context and being able to educate people educate people about the artwork. So I think that this is an important step for us to take um, to not just have these pieces, but to share them and to let people in on the story, you know, on how much Geraldine Rockefeller Dodge did for the area. And for, you know, the idea that um, her collection, yes, it's gone from, you know, where she was at Geraldo Farms, but that there's still little pieces of it um, in, in the town hall. And I think that's, that's an important thing to share. Uh, lastly, I think, you know, one of the interviews I gave, uh, sometimes they would ask really good questions and, make you sound like really profound. But uh, <laughs> something, you know, we were talking and the guy, um, you were, it just ended up being about like how, is this like a new piece of work by Rodin? And I said, well, not really. Like, you know, people, it was in the Met for years. Um, but it, in some senses, it kind of is. And I think that, you know, when an artist has been dead for 100 years, and it's an artist who's considered really the father of modern sculpture, and one of the most recognizable names in the art world, and one of the most appreciated artists, um, being able to give the world kind of a new piece by him um, is a really incredible gift, and it's something that I'm so proud of and that I'm so thankful that um, our foundation has, has given me the chance to do that. Um, and I'm also just so humbled by the amount of um, attention we've gotten, not just in the, in the media, but just really, like I said, those thoughtful questions and people who genuinely come up to me and shake my hand and say, thank you so much for the work you did. It's, um, it's been a really great experience as for our community and, and I think the world. So thank you so much. So if any of you have a question you might ask this lovely lady, let me know and I'll play Jerry Springer. <laughs> But uh, I, I quote Mallory 
yesterday because uh, last night I received a phone call from someone who has a, a client who's a, a, a French industrialist who would like Napoleon returned to its birthplace. And he said, we would like to buy it, and um, I will take care of all the arrangements, the transportation, and whatever else if you want to put it in the Louvre. Um, and because he said, because the Musée Rodet is not big enough, it's, uh, you know, it, it's a small museum, we, the Louvre gets so much more traffic. Um, so that's the sort of thing that we're, uh, Mallory is going to be uh, fielding for the foundation over the next uh, year. Because it's an on loan until November uh, 2018, and um, probably it would be great to have it um, back in uh, in France. The foundation uh, does not want it back in Madison. Um, you know, one thing that uh, we it wouldn't be fair because knowing now what we have. Um, there would be a great deal more traffic. We would have to make sure that the door was locked more, and the, the council chamber is so magnificent that they, they keep the door open during the day and people can come in. I mean, uh, one of the things that, uh, a humorous side, is that um, when Jerome McLeay came in and looked at it and said, this is where you've been hiding, I mean, there are fingerprints all over this thing. <laughs> and that is because we didn't know what we had. There was no barrier. You see those, those ropes? They didn't exist. There are fingerprints all over this thing, probably 10,000 plus fingerprints because for the last 80 years, there was no barrier to somebody going up and leaning up against it. Um, uh, so, it, and interestingly, the foundation said, well, should we paint before um, we, we do any more? And we were going to bring sort of a bucket of suds. <laughs> And when McGuay was sitting there describing uh, to Mallory and, and the foundation how important it was, and he said, and the patina <laughs> is, is still has a natural patina. Well, those are all of her fingerprints. <laughs> <laughs> Well, again, it's not owned by the town, it's owned by the Hartley Dodge Foundation. And as Nick explained, the foundation's mission is to maintain the integrity of the building. Um, so it's not, you know, I had so many questions when we were open for the weekend. People say, hey, lower taxes, sell the thing, right? <laughs> but we can't do that. So it, it's a really a separate entity, but thank you for asking. You know, it's interesting, our first play here this year was called Bakersfield Mist by Stephen Sachs. And I did this exact scenario. A woman discovers that she thinks she has a Jackson Pollock, and they actually bring an artificial from New York over to authenticate it. Where that hand go? Thank you very much for a great presentation. It's such a terrific story. It's the thing we all fantasize about. And you actually did it. Um, is there any thought of commissioning a reproduction of it for aesthetic reasons to how you fill that corner and kind of memorialize the history? Obviously, can't compare, but is there any thought of just to carry on that sort of parents' tradition memory? Sure. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And it's something that we have brought up to, as a, a board. Um, it's been like the last few weeks have been kind of like a total whirlwind for us that we definitely do have like kind of our list of things that when, when things kind of settle down to talk about. And we um, we have seen some things, a lot of times with paintings, where you know, if like a historical home or something like that, if a piece is taken out um, for a museum, that they'll do some kind of replica. Um, we did slightly rearrange the room and moved a, a bus of Lincoln to that corner. So it's not totally empty, because it was a little sad the first time I went in there and the pedestal was just empty. So we fixed that, so there's some balance and symmetry. Um, but we also talked about um, including some photographs and maybe even making some kind of um, historical kind of things that people can read in the building. We have some display cases and whatnot downstairs. So definitely we wanted to be part of Madison's history and a story that continues to be told. But that's a great point, and I think we'll definitely, um, like I said, it's on our, our to talk about list. Okay, well this is kind of random, but um, how did your family react whenever um, you told them that you might have found like a really, really expensive like, thing? <laughs> Right, right, guys? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's been kind of like a fun story 
around to keep a secret out of it. At any point, was there ever any signage that accompanied the piece? Um, no. Well, like, there's only, in the council chambers, there were a few things on frames, but um, like I said, when I started, no one even said we think this might be important. You know, as uh, Nick told you in the beginning of the story, how they just kind of hauled it to the middle of the room during the renovation. Um, people didn't think too much of it. Uh, so there wasn't, wasn't anything to start. So you would go to an artist and say, hey, I want you to draw my dog, right? So you're kind of requesting what they're going to create. So this person had said, I really want a marble sculpture of Napoleon. Now, Rodin, though, was a, a pretty big artist at this time, so he could say no to things, right? He would say, like, I'll do that, I'll do that, I don't want to do that one. So for whatever reason, he did want to do this sculpture. Um, and so that's why he did that, and then the person, they didn't finish it, but someone else saw it and, and, and asked him to finish it. So it was originally a, a request. So I'm dying to know, there's all the other things that Jody would drop in and hang up over lunch and walk away from her documentation. How are you coming on all the rest of the <laughs> Yeah, so her collection in there is, um, more significant than originally thought. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a reason why my part-time uh, one-year position has been extended indefinitely. <laughs> uh, there's definitely more, there are definitely more things to work on. Um, so, stay tuned. We have, we have more to share. <laughs> um, I, I thought I would, I thought it would be fun for me to share with you my perspective as a museum director from the other side of this kind of story, um, as, as Valerie shared with you, um, when she went uh, initially to, a, to, to approach museums about the possibility that she discovered Rodin, she had to confront this, this wall of skepticism, um, as, as museums are, are very conservative in, in, in um, any kinds of, of approaches like this that just come from the general public. Um, having just come here from a national uh, museum that had um, major, major holdings of rare musical instruments, um, I dealt with this on a weekly basis. We had four Stradivari um, instruments in our collection. We had a violin, a Stradivari violin, a Stradivari cello, a Stradivari mandolin, one of only two in the world, and a Stradivari guitar, one of only five Stradivari guitars. And we literally had uh, half a dozen requests every week from people uh, of the general public saying, I think I found a strat in my attic. <laughs> to the extent that we actually had on our website um, a, a page uh, that was titled, So You Think You Have a Strat. <laughs> and um, it, it, it was several paragraphs that suggested this is what you need to look at and these are things that you need to be skeptical of. And are you aware that in the 19th century there were entire industries that were producing Stradivarius replicas and pasting Strad labels inside of them? Um, and that there are literally tens of thousands of these replicas out there. But um, uh, to, to make a long story short, the museum world has all these filters in place because things of, of great value and things of great um, of importance, like this sculpture, are indeed very, very rare commodities, and the odds that you do have something so, so surprisingly important, the odds are so high that there is a great need to filter out a lot of the general requests. Um, I'm curious, Mallory, um, what kinds of things did they ask about when you were approaching museums? Uh, what, what, what did they want to hear from you? Was it, was it details of the, of the, of the, of the um, the, the chisel work? Was it details about the marble? Were they looking for any, anything in specific? I mean, yeah, at that point I really didn't have any information to share about the piece besides that it's in a town hall here. So um, I, like, I don't remember exactly details of what they'd asked me, but a lot of it was just like, well, you know, can you provide the history of the piece thus far? You know, and, and you couldn't. 
Um, and then also a lot of things, especially because like I said, I was going, what do I do now? A lot of them would say, well, we don't do anything with authentication, like go move on, you know? Um, so again, you know, the, the Frick at least, like I said, was the one who said like, look, we're not the right place to ask, but, but here, um, you know, so they at least pointed me in the right direction. Because like I said, at the beginning, I was kind of trying to figure this out just like anyone else <laughs> would be. Actually, um, kind of like a satellite of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So the curator that came out is actually she's the curator. Um, she's the curator of European sculpture in, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and also the curator of the Rodin Museum. So she even said that she they were considering it for both. Um, so she wanted it in the main building to start, and they've even talked about um, potentially moving it to the Rodin Museum. The Rodin Museum is a, um, a beautiful building. It's a smaller space, and they rotate their shows out every two years or a two-year cycle because the pieces are so big to move all the time. So they did mention that the next time that that cycle is up, that possibly. Um, if, if Napoleon would fit into what their, their installation is there. So it's not off the table, uh, but it's, it's part of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. In the Madison Municipal Building, there are several other objects in the same room where Napoleon was found. I think one is a bust of Benjamin Franklin. Yes. And there's a desk and two chairs that look ancient. <laughs> have, have you authenticated or have you investigated those? Yeah, thank you. So that's all part of the Hartley Dodge Foundation's collection. So I have done preliminary work on everything. Some things I'm further along with than others. Um, we are very um, cautious about the way that we present things until we really have the true backstory. We don't want to be um, kind of spreading false rumors about things, which is why you know, Napoleon has been shared because he's checked off. We know his whole story. He's good to go. Um, so we are still working on kind of figuring out the backstories of everything else. Um, because like I said, we came in with like no paperwork about anything, but just like some speculation and some ideas. So we are working on um, the, the Ben Franklin and the, the desk and the chair. So all of those things we are continuing to work on. and. Hopefully we'll have some good stuff to share with you guys soon. <laughs> what was your favorite period of art when you majored in art history? And part two, what was your career objective when you went through this program? Great question, thanks. Um, so in, as an, when you do an undergraduate in art history, they do a really great job of, um, it's really like the, you're getting the whole whole picture. You do a lot of, um, you, do, you do a survey course and then, um, so it's not like you don't specialize in this particular thing. Um, I've always loved um, like early American art um, and, and kind of like 19th century American painting. Um, that's just, just something that I'm just drawn to. Um, and when I went into Drew, I actually went in as an English major and I took um, an art history class my first semester. Uh, largely because my favorite place in the world was always the Met. Like any day that I'd like half day from school or something, I'd be like, Mom, can we go? So that was always what I, I wanted to do, um, just to be around art and learn about it. Um, and when I realized you could double major, I went, oh, I could do both of these things. So um, over time, while I was at Drew, I thought, you know, I'd like to work in a museum. Um, I did a few internships, and to be 100% honest, it's a really hard field in terms of getting jobs. Um, a lot of my internships that I found, I was like sitting at a desk all day going through databases, and I was like, this is boring. Um, but what I ended up doing at one of my internships, I asked if I could get trained to give tours, and I found that I really liked that. Um, I really enjoyed you know, working with whether it was kids or, or tourists from another country or, or whatnot. I really enjoyed doing that. Um, and that kind of made me rethink what I wanted to do. So from that, I actually decided to go into teaching. And I'm actually a sixth grade uh, like drugs teacher by day. Yeah, we've got some, some representatives there. Okay. Um, so, sixth grade language arts, it's like English class. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it kind of, you know, in a roundabout way, this job is so great because it lets me um, very much keep my feet in the art world. I mean, it's almost kind of crazy, like I'm doing things way cooler than I think I would have been had I traditionally gone into the field. Um, so it's, you know, I. I feel very lucky that I kind of get to do everything I like. <laughs> Sorry, uh, did you reach out to the Met? And you know, since it was there, I'm surprised they did not say. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were almost there. They had like their, their gallery laid out and we had a spot in it and everything. But um, if you've heard anything about the Met in the last recent you know, few months and year, um, they've been in a really hard place financially. Um, and they, their director stepped down and they're operating at an $8 million deficit. Um, so things have been kind of rough for them. So they actually um, cut all outside loans, even when we were willing to fund it. <laughs> So, yeah, so that was our first, um, I, again, I think like almost selfishly, like I love the Met, so I was like, it should be in the Met. Um, but also because it has that tie, you know, it was in the Met, Thomas Fortune Ryan's from New York, um, Thomas Fortune Ryan's collection is still at the Met. So we did want it there, but maybe, you know, eventually, uh, they were very interested though, when they came out, they loved it, they, you know, it just didn't work out. But Philadelphia was very willing and very excited about it, so we were happy to partner with them. Well, thank you all for being a part of this afternoon. Let's give her a hand.